Okay, let's start the second part of the morning. And I'm very happy to have here Roberto Pieci from the University of Bologna. And uh, we asked him to present a kind of review of uh, what is available in the literature about modeling real estate markets and prices, which is exactly the title of his talk. So thank you for coming, Roberto. First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Giacomo, Franco, and also Stefano, for inviting me here. And this symposium on return predictability, this is uh, uh, a talk about uh, housing market dynamic modeling. And let me spend a few words about the motivation for this talk. Uh, uh, set up, a modeling setup with heterogeneous agents, let's say an agent-based setup from a dynamical system perspective. And I presented some work on this uh, six months ago in Pisa in a workshop organized by Stefano and, uh, um, uh, and Fabrizio, okay, Fabrizio, about uh, uh, deterministic and stochastic dynamics in economics. Carsoms. Carsoms. But deterministic stochastic dynamics in economics and finance. And uh, uh, in that occasion, I presented uh, an, an agent based model uh, of housing market dynamics. And uh, I tried to summarize uh, briefly the literature and uh, to point out the, uh, let's say, prominent research issues from this perspective. And uh, Giacomo Franco asked me to expand this part about the literature review and to produce a presentation for this workshop that could be useful for the audience. Uh, so this is not specifically about uh, predictability, but it, it is very much related to it from, from certain uh, aspects. And uh, um, also, um, there is a lot of stuff inside this presentation, so it, it will be not possible to present everything here. But of course, uh, Especially, there is, there is many, many references for different issues. But of course, I will uh, leave uh, uh, slides to people who may be interested in, in this. So let me uh, just uh, introduce briefly my talk. And then I will talk uh, a little about theories of house price dynamics. Uh, then I will uh, reinterpret a basic equilibrium condition for asset markets in the case of real estate markets. And I will uh, talk about the so-called user cost theory in real estate markets. Um, then I will talk about the stock flow approach, talk about the role of expectations, uh, the, the, the supply side, the role of the supply side, the role of expectations, and then I will conclude. OK, so let me say that this, this talk is more let's say, a collection of thoughts uh, about uh, uh, the basic uh, um, mechanism, about modeling the basic mechanisms that can lead to house price movements, to deviations of prices from the fundamentals, uh, to adjustments, to disequilibrium, and so on. The role of supply, of expectations, and so on. So researchers. Uh, start to, to study uh, and to, to, to model housing markets, housing market dynamics, uh, come across uh, 
immediately come across three facts. The first is that uh, housing market modeling is a truly interdisciplinary field. If you look at the literature, you see contribution from real estate economics, microeconomics, macroeconomics, regional and urban economics, finance, financial economics and econometrics, behavioral finance, and so on. This is naturally due to the many facets of housing market issues, but this is also due, especially in the case of macroeconomics, this is also due to the economy-wide effects of possibly dramatic house price movements, as we have seen in the last, uh, in the last years. There are also several theories, modeling approaches, to house price dynamics. And uh, the literature always and very often points out that housing markets have a range of unique features compared with other asset markets. And here is a list of these features, but there are many others. Uh, different from, for instance, stock or exchange rates, or currencies. Housing is both an asset and a consumption good. Housing markets are segmented markets with heterogeneous assets. So there are different types of real estate, uh, residential, office, and so on. Uh, housing markets are characterized by illiquidity, infrequent trading, localized markets, limited information available. There are high, high transaction costs, depreciation, maintenance costs, specific tax, tax issues, and also uh, high unit value of the asset, so the, the issue of indivisibility and limits to diversification. That's because uh, many people are home owners, and therefore their portfolio, their wealth is bias towards housing that just because they have to live somewhere and they own their house. And these features are often regarded by the literature as reasons for a potentially less efficient pricing process compared to other asset markets. So let me briefly review the theories of house price dynamics. This is a, a personal classification. This is based essentially on the aspects of housing markets that are stressed by each theory. Okay? Uh, Demand-oriented theories, for instance, uh, uh, this is a number of references or early references. And the early, early work, for instance, by Potter, by Rosen and Smith, and so on, Monkey Van Veil, this is a very, a very popular uh, paper, focus on aggregate drivers of the demand. For instance, the income, interest rates, demographic change. They try to estimate the, the effect on house prices of shifts in these exogenous variables. And there is more recent work, and it's set in partial equilibrium. We have representative households uh, maximizing utility from consumption and housing services. So we have typically two arguments in the utility function, consumption of a composite good and housing services. There is a lifetime budget constraint, and the focus is on the aggregate consumption, house purses, decisions, wealth effects. And very often in these kind of models, uh, price dynamics is taken as given. So it's exogenous. Okay. There are also fundamental-based theory, theories, such as the so-called user cost rent equivalence theory. I will talk about it later. There is a so-called stock flow approach. The stock flow approach regards the housing market as the combination of three interrelated markets, integrated markets. One is the market for housing services, which determines the rent, which is the price of housing services. The rent then determines the price of the stock, the housing, and then there is a market, uh, let's say a sector for new constructions. So markets are regarded as a combination of three different submarkets. Then there are models that are supply oriented, for instance, recent work by Glaser, Giurko, and others, who regard the supply as the key factor that can shape housing bubbles. They start from the from the, from the observation that uh, housing bubbles have been very different uh, across different cities, and they relate these difference, differences with different supply conditions. Then there are models that are expectation-based. There is the work by Robert Schiller, but there are also models by Piazzesi and Schneider about optimism in housing markets, and other agent-based models. This is a recent paper published in the Journal of Banking and Finance, which is about the uh, interplay of heterogeneous agents in the housing market. 
they stress optimism, pessimism, hurting behavior, extrapolative expectations, and so on. Then there is many models that are general equilibrium models. Here are some recent models. They are inspired by non-housing dynamic equilibrium models that are very popular in monetary economics. So they basically treat uh, housing as any other asset. They are inspired by those uh, often DSGE models. They have a neoclassical core and nominal real rigidities, and the focus is on the interaction between housing and the broader macroeconomy. Then there are search models. Search models stress a typical feature of housing market, which is a costly search effort, vacancies, frictions, and liquidity constraints, and this feature, which is very important but is absent from the other models, which is the non-market clearing features of housing. Let me start from a very simple equation based uh, um, on uh, basic equation of asset pricing, which uh, regards the price today as the expected payoff by uh, stock market investors discounted, discounted using the expected return required by investors. Okay, this is a very basic setup. And we know that this setup, in combination with rational expectations, forms the basis for so-called rational valuation methods. For instance, the computation of the so-called fundamental price, but also the theory of rational bubbles, and uh, um, the use, for instance, of the price dividend ratio to assess over undervaluation of the price and so on. We all know that the fundamental price can be computed, for instance, assuming that dividend grows over time. This is the, the, the well-known Gordon growth model, and so on. And this model is consistent with the Fisher market hypothesis because if you look at this, for instance, you see that dividend yields immediate, are immediately reflected in the fundamental price, okay? So essentially, the part of the price we reflect the exogenous noise process on the dividends. Uh, a similar formal setup, formal setup, is traditionally adopted also for house prices, because this is a, essentially the same equation, and this is the dividend component of the housing investment, which is the rent. So the price can be obtained in the same uh, formal manner. For instance, with constant required returns, we obtain a similar formula, which is, uh, this is already, this is again the, 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 the Gordon growth model, and this is, for instance, an expression for the rent to price ratio, which is equal to the required rate of return minus the expected appreciation rate of the, of the rents, which is immediately reflected in the expected appreciation rate of the price. Okay? So this is basically already what it is called the user cost in housing market theory, in real estate theory. There are formal analogies, but substantial differences with the case of financial markets. I'll try to illustrate them. First of all, there are two interpretations for the equilibrium condition in the slide before, because housing is both an asset and a consumption good. So the equation before was, a, was the asset market view of housing markets, but of course the same equation can be rewritten in this way, and this is an indifferent condition between renting and owning a house, but this is strictly related to this dual nature of housing, this is absent, this interpretation is absent from other asset markets, in a sense. This is the, the cost of renting, this is the rent, and this is the cost on, of owning. This quantity here on the left hand side is called the imputed rent. This quantity divided by the price at time t, which is this one, is called the user cost of housing. And g is again the expected appreciation. So essentially, this equation states that uh, the actual expected rent must be equal to the imputed rent, okay? What is, I mean, what is uh, the user cost? The user cost, this is in the next slide, but the user cost is defined as the cost of owning a given standardized amount of housing space for one period. So there is an indifference condition because I can own my house or I can rent the house, but from an equilibrium perspective, this must hold. What are other issues? Roughly speaking, roughly speaking, because 
we may discuss about this, but the discount rate, in the case of asset markets, the discount rate K is based on well-established theories and equilibrium models, but in the case of housing, things are different because the user cost theory is still largely debated. Okay, there are many, many, uh, there, there is even disagreement about what is the user cost. If you look at the recent literature, you see this. Uh, how is the user cost defined? This is a, I expanded the K in the previous equation. This is again G, minus G is minus expected appreciation. The K is expanded in this way. RF is a risk-free nominal interest rate, but it may be also the mortgage rate, okay, in the case of housing. Uh, omega is the property tax rate, and this one minus tau, where tau is the investor's marginal tax rate, is because of deductibility of uh, um, interest payments on mortgages and property taxes. Here, property taxes are expressed as a fraction of the value of the asset. Then there is this delta, which is the depreciation. This mu is something very related to depreciation, is the maintenance cost. This alpha is a very critical component because this is the risk premium, but the risk premium is meant as the risk premium of owning versus renting a house because both choices are risky. So in principle, we should estimate the risk premium, which is the difference of renting and owning risk premium. What are the issues with this formula? The issues are, there is a lot of literature about this. What is the impact on RF, the mortgage rate, for instance, of innovations in the market market? They have an effect on the cost of mortgages. Of course, another issue is the property tax and tax benefits. They vary largely across countries, depend on government policies. In Italy, they also vary chaotically over time. We know this. Then there is the issue of housing market risk premium. Uh, another issue is how, how do we measure G, the expected appreciation, and so on. Uh, another point is that the user cost theory is based on a kind of low cost arbitrage or no arbitrage between renting and buying. However, there are a number of issues also here because there is a high cost of switching back and forth between owning and renting, of course. There are different characteristics on average between owned homes and rental units. So the two markets are not perfect substitutes. And also another issue uh, is the limited availability of data and with, as compared with, with uh, uh, financial markets where prices, dividends are readily available, indexes and so on. But here there is issues about the measurement and aggregation of re both rents and prices, even prices, because there are many ways. The most natural way is to call transaction-based prices, but transactions are infrequent. So other methods have been developed, for instance, hedonic methods, repeat sales, and so on. So there is a number of issues about this. Another issue is that while, roughly speaking, while in the asset market we can in asset market modeling, when in principle assume that the dividend process and the supply of asset is exogenous or exogenously given, here it's hard to assume this because the dividend process, which is the rent and the supply, are in some, in some sense endogenous to the model itself because the rent clearly depends on the supply stock because the rent is the price of housing services. Housing services are proportional in each time, in each time period to the housing stock and depend on the intersection of demand and supply for housing, but the housing stock changes over time due to depreciation and new constructions. New constructions delivered at time t are housing starts at time t minus n, and in principle, they could be based on the information available at time t minus n, so there is a problem of expectations here, but in any case, the rent changes with the uh, supply and supply changes to, due to the lagged effect of past investment decisions. So there is some endogenous dynamics inside, even in the case of rational agents. And the basic mechanism of these dynamics are captured by the so-called stock flow approach. This is a very popular picture in, in real estate economics textbooks. This is a stock flow model, so-called four-quadrant model. 
Here is the market for housing services, the stock and the rent, a negatively slope demand function, and the rent, inverse demand function, sorry. And here is the, the equilibrium value of the rent. Then look at this equation. There is no expectation here. I mean, the, the rent is immediately taken as what determines the price. So this is the dividend discount model applied to housing markets. The price is here. Price determines due con construction due to equilibrium between um, price and construction costs. And then the new constructions plus depreciation determine the level, determines the level of the supply here, of the stock of housing. This is clearly an equilibrium configuration, but it is useful because it can help to understand, I mean, uh, to um, offer, it offers comparative statics inside because I can, for instance, shift, assume a shift of the inverse demand curve for housing services because, for instance, population growth and, and other factors and see what happens to the price and to, uh, and to everything, okay? But what is missing in this model is the adjustment mechanisms, of course. So the stock flow approach is very popular in real estate economics. It characterizes the joint equilibrium of price, rent, stock, and new construction. And, but the introduction of dynamic adjustments to exogenous shocks, for instance, interest rate shocks, very typical, Demand shocks requires making assumptions on price expectations, supply response, construction lags, and so on. A simple case is the model used already by Poterba in 19, uh, end of the 80s. And it is a perfect foci model. It is a deterministic model, actually, with perfect foci, which is a deterministic equivalent of rational expectations, let's say. And uh, it models exactly what I uh, described earlier. There is an equation for the price. This is basically, again, the user cost equation, written in a different manner. And this is adjustment equation for the stock. What is the important insight with this model? The important insight is this. If you look at the steady state of this model, you see that basically the price is given by the discounted value of the rent. But this is the equilibrium rent, of course, the steady state value of the, of, of, the, of the rent, because it depends on the steady state value of the, of the housing stock. On the other hand, the housing stock can be determined once this has been, this is a, an equation two variable can be solved numerically or analytically depending on the, on the functions. But what happens if we are in the initial steady state level here, and there is, for instance, something that changes, uh, uh, for instance, the level of the rent, which means that the demand increases the, the to some exogenous factors. If you look at this, you see that both the price and the stock increase, and the new steady state will be here, but the system now is here, the new steady state is here. Under uh, uh, perfect foresight, since this steady state has the saddle path stability property, economic theory postulates that the system will be immediately due to the price uh, variation on the saddle part of the new steady state and then it will convert to the steady state. If you look at the time, se uh, time series, you see that the price will overshoot the new steady state level just once at the time of the un unanticipated shock, but the stock will adjust gradually to the new stock level. So the essential feature here is there is that the price overshoot just once in response to an exogenous shock, and the stock doesn't overshoot the new state level, so there is no overbuilding. This is a well-behaved adjustment in a sense. And uh, what is the effect of multiple repeated shocks? Of course, the effect of repeated shocks would be that this steady state moves back and forth, uh, and this will have the effect of creating cycles. But cycles that are driven by exogenous shifts of the demand, for instance, or, in the, or the interest rate, plus the adjustment mechanism towards the new equilibrium, even in the case of perfect foresight. So this is summarizing this slide. Well-behaved means no repeated price overshooting, no overbuilding in response to a single shock. Another factor important is that the real factors, for instance, supply elasticity, demand elasticity, depreciation, have no qualitative impact on the qualitative adjustment pattern. So, it's just a matter of time, of adjustment, size of the adjustment, but not, there is no qualitative differences. Cycles may be not regenerated by repeated shocks, 
And an important point, a key point, is that when we see a real estate cycle, is this the effect of shifts in possibly fragile fundamentals, or is this the effect of extrapolative expectations and frenzy given the fundamentals? So this is a key issue in housing research. And there are mixed results in this, in this direction, of course. Another approach, uh, uh, so this is, this is the, the dynamic of the stock flow approach again. I will skip this because this is very uh, similar to the previous one, but essentially there is a very popular model by Wheaton, very cited model in the, in the real estate literature. Uh, Wheaton compares, in, in this setup, compares myopic and perf myopic expectations, perfect foresight, okay? Uh, of course, real estate cycles naturally emerge uh, endogenously under myopic expectations, but more interestingly, in the case of cyclical behavior housing prices, um, in this case, in the case of myopic expectations, the cyclical behavior depends crucially on the real factors. So why in the case of perfect foresight, the qualitative adjustments are pretty much the same if we vary the supply elasticity, demand elasticity, and so on. In the case of other kinds of expectations, there is a strong dependence on these factors. And since these factors vary a lot across different types of real estate, this matters for interpreting the cyclical movements of house prices, okay? Okay, this is the model by Wheaton. Let me just show the picture. This is a picture taken from the, the paper by Wheaton. This is a case, both cases are with myopic expectations. If you look at this case, the steady state changes from here to here. If you look at this case, you see that the stock has exactly the same qualitative behavior as the perfect for sign model. Okay? And the price has exactly the same qualitative behavior as the perfect for site model. But this is a case with myopic expectations and low values, for instance, of the relatively low values of the, of the supply elasticity. But if, for instance, the supply elasticity increases, so new constructions, in a sense, overreact, then the differences are uh, very big because now the stock badly overshoots the new steady state level, and also the price oscillates repeatedly around the new steady state level as a consequence of a unique shock, okay? So the, the point in, in Wheaton's paper is that expectations matter a lot in combination with the real side of housing markets. This is another paper that focuses on how much time do I have? 15 minutes, okay. This is another, uh, another uh, paper about the role of housing supply a recent paper by Kleser and others. Uh, the, 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 the framework is somehow close to that of the stock flow model. The focus here is on uh, um, the impact of supply side on the nature of housing bubbles. Let me briefly describe this model. There is a stock of housing, H, new construction, Psi, and the homes for sale at time T, and of course, uh, the homes of sale at time T are given by the new constructions completed at that time, plus the fraction of the housing stock that is sold at that time. There is a, the assumption of a Poisson shock with probability lambda in each period forcing homeowners to sell and leave the city, okay? On the supply side, the price equals the marginal cost of development. By this very simple equation, there is a, an increase in marginal cost. Uh, from, from the demand side, there is a steady flow of risk neutral potential buyers who buy if the expected discounted utility gain from living in the city plus the future selling price exceeds the current price, okay? There are some technical details, a time invariant utility flow distributed uniformly across buyers, and at each time there exists a marginal buyer uh, which determines the demand level this way. From the demand side, this is essentially the discounted utility flow. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this concerns potential home buyers, okay? This is the discounted utility flow, and this is the discounted expected selling price, okay? And if this is, the equilibrium requires that this is equal to the current price, okay? Because of the uh, feature of the existence of the marginal buyer. From the supply side, there is a developers in different condition, which is this one. This is the new constructions at time t. And 
we impose market clearing, also in this case market clearing is a standard assumption, and this yields PT and DT, the demand as a function of current stock of housing and expected future prices, okay? Then, Glazer, Gjurko, and others consider different expectations model, the rational expectation model, an exogenous over, overestimate of the rational, rational expectation um, uh, model, and an endogenous self-reinforcing extrapolative expectation. And they find that supply elasticity is crucial in that we have longer bubbles and larger price increases in more inelastic places, but the post-bubble impact on prices and the welfare losses may be larger in more elastic areas. So there is a trade-off, okay, between the, the size of the bubble and the post-bubble effects of the crash. Um, they also find uh, uh, empirical evidence uh, which is consistent with the conclusion, the same paper. This is about the United States. This is about the United States. Another, an, an, another widely debated uh, issue is that of overbuilding. There is no <laughs> rigorous definition of overbuilding, but if you look at the literature, you see that overbuilding may mean, might mean stock increases, stock increases beyond the new long-run level after a shock. And another more general or generic, let's say, definition is that we have building booms in face of declining demand and property values, which has been reported also in the US housing uh, market. The causes are maybe supply, from the perspective of these models, maybe supply elasticity and development lags in the stock flow model, but there are also other explanations that are, in a sense, more rational, more grounded in rational theory, one is strategic exercise of the option to build, um, which is a, 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 an important paper by Grenadier. And then there is also Russian overbuilding carried out, carried out by developers' decision under uncertainty, uh, with, um, motivated by statistical or reputation-based herding. So there are many different explanations of this phenomenon. Prices continue to grow in face of, uh, sorry, stock continues to grow in face of declining prices and declining demand. Probably the reason is a mix <laughs> of, of, of many factors. The effects, of course, there is some literature pointing out that the level of overbuilding reached during the boom is an important factor for the size of crashes. There is some empirical work in this direction. And of course, there are also distortive effects on resource allocation, welfare effects, as pointed out by Glaser and others. Expectations. Um, we have a, this is probably the, <laughs> the part of the talk which is somehow related with predictability. There is a lambda, large number of studies on real estate market efficiency since at least three decades. There are comprehensive surveys about this. To my knowledge, this is the most recent one, most cited in recent years. And a number of empirical studies report a positive and serial correlation of house price movements over the short run. Some report a kind of mean reversion over the long run. And another fact is that deviations of house prices from proxies for the fundamentals have predictive power in explaining future returns. So a number of studies question the real estate market efficiency and argue that expectations may not be rational. Early studies in this direction are these. There is this work by Mankiv and Whale about the so-called baby boomers. And there is work by Case and Schiller and other work questioning real estate market efficiency. And there are also recent studies, for instance, this recent work by Schindler points out that uh, in real estate markets, trading strategies based on moving average, moving averages, could outperform more simple buy and hold strategies, okay? This is the evidence provided by these papers. Okay, about expectations, the work by Schiller, of course, uh, everybody knows it, points out the impact of extrapolative expectations and so-called irrational exuberance. The work by Piazzegi and Schneider, they consider uh, households' beliefs during the recent US housing boom based on survey responses. And they find out from the data, uh, applying cluster analysis, that there is a momentum cluster of optimistic investors, 
those who think that it is a good time to buy a house because prices will go up. And this, the size of this cluster increases towards the end of the boom, okay, when prices are already very close to the top. And they build a simple search model of the housing market. And this model shows that few optimists can drive up transaction prices without a large increase in trading volume and their market share. And they explain this uh, phenomenon, uh, and they as ascribe this phenomenon to some kind of optimistic behavior of a few, fra uh, a small fraction of optimistic investors. Recent work by Sommerville and others build a heterogeneous agent model with buyers, sellers, and mortgagees. They use extrapolative expectations, and they find that mild, uh, they basically study the effect of credit rationing in this setup. And they find that without credit rationing, cre rationing this feature of extrapolative expectations creates mild oscillations around the steady state price, but with credit rationing, this phenomenon can be exacerbated and can cause the market to collapse. So basically, they study an exogenous shock on credit market in the case of no rational expectations on the um, welfare uh, of the economy. Then there is other work which is more oriented to heterogeneous agent, agent-based models in housing markets. Uh, basically, this work studies the interplay between extrapolative beliefs and regressive beliefs, let's say fundamentalists and extrapolators. Conclusion. What, what uh, is impressing is that there is, if you look at the literature coming from different sources, from different areas, one important point is that there is a rich and complex interaction structure between, uh, the literature points out a rich and complex interaction structure between expectations and the real side of housing markets. The impact of expectations or speculation may vary largely across different types of real estate. Okay? From the demand side, this is much due to the fact that housing is both, both a consumption good and an asset. So this allows to separate, let's say, the real demand, which is demand for housing services, and the speculative demand, which is based on expected appreciation. So this perspective allows to compare the rent with the price, and here we have the role of the price-rent ratio and the, and, and, as an indicator of possible um, uh, overvaluation of house prices. From the supply side, the role of development lags, past expectations, uh, uh, which affect current housing stock, and the joint impact of expectations and speculation uh, together with supply elasticity in determining possible overbuilding of the housing market are prominent issues. So this is the end of my talk. So thank you, Roberto. As you have seen, OK, many questions. At the beginning of the presentation, you were discussing pricing for real estate that clearly yeah problem because, it's, as you say, the yeah, transaction... Pr pricing within, so within that model, which is simply borrowed from asset pricing, okay? No, no, but model to price, secure, to price real estate because, uh, as you said, transactions, they do not often, they do not happen quite often. Uh, I was wondering, um, what are the input of the model that are trying to do pricing for uh, real estate? What, what are the input? In, in the model that try to do pricing and how this model perform. It means, I'm not talking about predictability, about uh, real estate pricing, but um, certainly you can run the model, try to see what say the model about the pricing and then you can compare the price with the transaction price when there is a transaction. I'm not, I must say I'm not a specialist of this, of this field, but what, what I understood by looking at the literature, and I, I, I reported a lot of literature on the topic, what I understood is that, uh, of course, pricing uh, requires, pricing, I, I mean, uh, using the, dis, the dividend discount model for real estate assets requires uh, estimating having available data on the, on the rents, okay, and knowing what is called uh, the uh, user cost, okay. But this uh, appears to be quite a problem. I mean, there are many efforts, 
trying to estimate a kind of fundamental price from these uh, inputs and compare this uh, with the actual price, okay? And, uh, but, but there are mixed results. I mean, different estimation techniques, different data sources may yield different estimations of the different computations of the fundamental price, okay? This is what I understood about the literature. But uh, what I wanted to point out is the issue. Uh, yeah, and, and then I, I, I prefer to, to, to uh, quote the, the relevant literature about this because there is a lot of open issues about that. One question, which is really, I really like your presentation, and uh, uh, it's uh, how much of this could be carried for understanding uh, different countries. I mean, there are countries, where, for example, where the supply, um, where the elasticity of supply varies a lot. Okay, think of Italy. Elasticity of supply is very limited. In the okay. U.S., it may be dependent on credit conditions, but certainly is not very limited. Okay, so just to make an example, there is an extreme case, which is South Korea, which I know by relationship, where elasticity of supply, which is basically Seoul, and where elasticity of supply is almost unexistent for also physical limitations, I mean, somehow. Gold so, Singapore. is there anything in the literature, since you looked at a lot of literature, which tries to see if the uh, data set, which, by the way, I understand are patchy and short and so on, show this in a clear way or not? Uh, in, in my presentation, I, I uh, reported, uh, first of all, literature, uh, about the US situation. But there is a lot of papers uh, exploring supply conditions in uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, and any other place. So uh, the point is that supply, supply conditions and supply elasticity also have some measurement issues because supply condition is not just, uh, I mean, estimating how, pro how developers react to an increase in prices, but it depends on, on, also on um, regulation, for instance, of the, of, the, of, the, of the area and so on. So uh, those uh, guys, uh, Glazer, Giurko, and others who uh, wrote that paper, also um, uh, built uh, uh, some measures of supply elasticity that take into account these facts. For instance, regulation and things like this. But what I, what I cited is mainly uh, about the US, US uh, situation. One big question is why some countries had a real estate bubble and then a crash and some other countries did not. We already uh, talked about it. Now my opinion is that in some countries interest payments on mortgages are deductible under the income tax. This is the case in the United States and in Spain and in these countries, the bubble was really strong and the crash was really strong. Some other countries like Germany, where it's not deductible, kind of, we did not have a bubble and did not have a crash. So I think the big question is the deducti deductibility of interest payment on mortgages. And I think all countries should stop that. Sure, and, and in fact, uh, uh one of the main areas of research in the early literature on the effect of demand on house prices was concerned about the role of tax policies. Because uh, there is, even in the US, there is a widespread perception that changes in these policies can change a lot the demand of housing and also, presumably, the size of the bubble. But you're right, I think so. So the problem is that <laughs> is about the, the situation of Italy because it's, it's it, in general it's very difficult to to take into account all these factors, uh, property taxes, uh, deductions, and so on. But the situation in, in Italy is very chaotic and changing over time, very 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 often. So it might be very difficult. These are additional difficulties to assess. Uh, let's say because to compare. Bubble was not as large, and the crash was not as large. <laughs> yes. So possibly the changes were good for Italy. Possibly. <laughs> okay, thank you. If there are no more questions, uh, let's thank again Roberto.